Oh. Here it comes. Oh, 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 the blood is all wrong. Now, why do they do that? It's too red. Wait, here comes another. Here, here. Oh, yes! Oh. yes! Predictable. I knew he was going to bite it. How can you watch this shit over and over? Shh. When do we see breasts? I want to see Jamie Lee's breasts. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breasts? Breasts? Not until Trading Places in 83. Jamie Lee was always the virgin in horror movies. She never showed her tits till she went legit. Could afford a decent pair. <laughs> What'd you say? That's why she always outsmarted the killer in the big chase scene at the end. Only virgins can do that. Don't you know the rules? What rules? You don't... Jesus Christ, you don't know the rules? Uh, have an aneurysm, why don't you? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, Number one, you can never have sex. Big no no! Big no! I'm a dead man. Sex equals death, okay? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. No, the sin factor. It's a sin, it's an extension of number one. And number three, never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer, you want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back! Oh! You see, you push the laws and you end up dead. Okay, I'll see you in the kitchen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode where we're breaking the mold, right? We're going to be going over horror movies that have broken all of the stereotypical tropes and have really set themselves apart as movies in the genre that can be iconic and can be looked at as almost templates for horror movies to come. I'm really excited to go over all these movies with you. I'm excited to talk about the tropes. And I have a lot of opinions from other people, <laughs> other than me, that we get to listen to and that we get to review. So I'm really excited about that. I'm excited to include a lot more people on this episode of the podcast. Thanks, everybody, who gave their thoughts, their opinions on different horror movie tropes and things of the like. I really appreciate it. It always makes it easier to put together every episode when I get the opinions and feedback of my fans. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate all of the support you guys have been giving me. And there's going to be so much more to come. I've got a really cool episode coming up after this one. We're going to be reviewing Saw 3. And I'm already polling my Instagram followers on giving their thoughts. And I'm also going to be polling all of my people who are in the Legion Discord server, which if you're not, by the way, the link is in the episode of this broadcast. So I would love it if you came over to our Discord server. What that is, is it's a place for us to hang out and chat and just talk about horror offline. There's tons of different chat boards and channels that you can drop some comments in about horror movies. And it's really heavily tied with our Twitch account too. So if you if you haven't followed us on Twitch, we'd love a follow there too. Twitch which is a great platform. It's It allows us to play video games together, watch movies, have commentary, and just shoot the shit and have a good time together. And I know a lot of you are having fun <laughs> messing with me and fucking with me on the streams. That will never go away. That will always be there. So come on in, hang out with us during the stream. If you like the vibe, drop us a follow. We're always on Twitch during the weekend, so it's always a good time and definitely a terrifying experience. And this week in horror, we've got actually a lot of good news coming into the horror genre this week the first one is that we actually have some news on scream six we've got two people joining the cast of the movie now we have samara weaving and tony revelori joining the cast of scream six samara weaving you re may remember from the movie ready or not and uh, she was also in ash versus evil dead Tony Revolori was in Spider-Man Homecoming and No Way Home. So these are two people that some might know. I know Samara Weaving. I saw Ready or Not. Ready or Not was actually a pretty good movie. I actually really, really enjoyed uh, Ready or Not. So I'm, I'm interested to see Samara Weaving in this role. Not quite sure on Tony Revolori, but it's a screen movie. So at the end of the day, you got to cast young actors and actresses in the role, right? And more news coming into the horror genre is that we have a premiere date for Chucky Season 2. A teaser trailer dropped and totally revealed the uh, premiere date for Chucky Season 2 to be October 5th, 2022. So we are going to get the second season of Chucky right before Halloween. So Halloween season is going to be 
Chucky season this year, and I am excited as shit for it. And Brad Dourif and Jennifer Tilly will both be back for Chucky season two. So that's going to be absolutely epic. And not only that, but they also casted Devin Sawa. Devin Sawa will be playing a new character in the second season. How fucking awesome is that? For anyone who doesn't know, Devin Sawa is an amazing fucking underrated actor, okay? We're talking Idle Hands, the first Final Destination movie, fucking Casper. Devin Sawa is an amazing actor. Even in his adult age, I've watched a couple of movies with him, um, with his, his comeback that I noticed he's been making, and he's been doing an amazing job. The dude can act. Like, Devin Sawa is so underrated, so the fact that he's coming in to play a new character in the second season of Chucky, that just tickles me fucking pink. And the Chucky Season 2 uh, teaser trailer, it wasn't the only trailer that we got. We also got a trailer for the Munsters. Now, I've watched the trailer, I watched the trailer, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm interested. I'm actually, before, when I first heard about the news of the Munsters, I was very on the fence. Because, don't get me wrong, I love Rob Zombie, I love everything he's done except for the Halloween movies, and he, the, the, the guy can create a horror movie. The guy can create an atmosphere. Rob Zombie can create a horror movie. He can create an atmosphere, and he can create a terrifying experience. The Munsters, while spooky, is not necessarily a terrifying experience, and definitely not one full of blood and gore, especially with a PG rating. So I was on the fence. I was really on the fence. I didn't know if he'd actually be able to pull it off without going straight to too much camp. But in the trailer, there's a good amount of camp. It's a good amount of camp. And it looks like it may actually be a really good homage to the original monsters while giving us something new, which I'm in for. I'm in for. The only thing that I'm still on the fence about is Sherry Moon Zombie. I don't know if she can pull this off. I don't know if she can actually portray the role in a way that is creepy and almost like Morticia-esque without coming across as ditzy. Because the trailer, to me, Sherry Moon Zombie came off very ditzy in the role and not the Sherry Moon zombie that we've come to know and love, which I get, I get you can't have the same character in every character, right? You have to have that separation between each character. But I don't know if I can see her playing a ditzy role and doing it realistically. You know, like when you're putting an, an actress in that kind of role where they may have to play somewhat of a ditz, you want the actress to actually be believable in it. And I don't think Sherry Moon zombie is believable as a ditzy female character. So... I really hope that they did that right, and I hope that's just the portrayal of the character or the trailer that we're getting. I just hope that it's not. It remains to be seen. It remains to be seen. It's coming out next, or not next month, sorry. It's coming out in September. So we're going to have to wait and see exactly how, uh, how amazing or not amazing Rob Zombie did with it. And in what I would call the most exciting news of the week, and I mean that very lit literally. The most exciting news of the week, which isn't even news, actually. Technically, it's a rumor. <laughs> Technically, this is a rumor, but I am counting it as news because I have been chomping at the bit for something, guys. I have been chomping at the bit for something very specific. The Halloween Ends trailer. And I know a lot of you, too, have been waiting, anticipating, and probably went and saw fucking the black phone in theaters just for a hope that the Halloween Ends trailer was going to be released before Black Phone, which it obviously wasn't. But now, now we may, we may, we may have news on when the Halloween Ends trailer is going to drop. Jamie Lee Curtis dropped a tweet that all it had was a pumpkin in it, a pumpkin emoji, with the date 720. So really, really, how can we not assume that she is not talking about the Halloween Ends trailer, <laughs> right? You don't tweet out a pumpkin, which is synonymous with Halloween, <laughs> and then the date 720, when every single Halloween fan right now is chirping you and Jason Bloom to give us a fucking Halloween Ends trailer. So I, I feel like we can safely say that on July 20th, we are going to get the official trailer for Halloween Ends. Not the concept trailer that was released at CinemaCon, but the official trailer for Halloween Ends, which I am here for. I am pumped. I am sitting, waiting for that movie. I am counting down the days until that movie is released in October. Because I am going to be there with fucking bells on to watch that movie. I cannot wait. It is literally my most anticipated movie of this year. I'm really excited for Evil Dead Rises. Don't get me wrong. Evil Dead Rises is going to be obviously a really good movie. And I am pumped for it. But Halloween Ends. Halloween Ends is the movie that I've been waiting for since Halloween Kills. And I will continue to wait for it until it arrives. And then I will be sad when it ends. Because I know it's going to be the last Halloween movie in this trilogy. So hopefully they end it with a bang. 
I have high hopes. I'm going, I'm tr- trying not to go in with high expectations because it is a horror movie after all. And we all know how trilogy horror <laughs> movies can go. So I'm trying to keep my expectations low, but it's proving to be pretty fucking difficult. <laughs> So this week's episode, we're going over the stereotypical tropes of horror movies. And we know that horror movies are very well known for their stereotypical tropes. Things like having sex while a killer's on the loose. That's a surefire way that you're going to get killed. Using drugs or saying things like, I'll be right back. Are also examples of the kind of tropes that we see in our horror movies that are definitely going to uh, mark a character for death. Though there are many iconic horror movies which broke the mold and they stand aside from the rest. Movies that took stereotypical horror movie tropes and then turned them on its head. These are the movies that not only remain called classics in the horror genre, but have become iconic films seen worldwide. So I've gone through five movies that we're going to talk about on this episode of the podcast. These movies not only set themselves apart from the rest while smashing through the horror movie tropes, but they also became an inspiration for horror movies that followed in their subgenre. The first one we're going to go over is one that's much different from others in its subgenre, and that's 28 Days Later. In 2002, audiences were introduced to this movie. It's a British post-apocalyptic horror movie directed by Danny Boyle and written by Alex Garland. The film stars Cillian Murphy as a bicycle courier who awakens from a coma and discovers a highly contagious, aggression-inducing virus has been accidentally released. Wow, sounds awfully familiar to uh, something we could have experienced in 2020. But um, bunch. <laughs> so this caused a complete and utter breakdown of society in the movie, and we get to see exactly how that unfolds in society, of course. And while writing this film, Garland took inspiration from George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead film, and he also took inspiration from John Wyndham's 1951 novel, The Day of the Triffids. And the film itself was critically acclaimed. It was a financial success, grossing over $82.7 million worldwide, with a budget of only $8 million. And it became one of the most profitable horror films in 2002. And the funny thing about this movie is that the director, Danny Boyle, actually doesn't consider... 28 Days Later to be a zombie film, despite the fact that it's been credited for completely reinvigorating the zombie genre and causing a revival of the subgenre years after its release. So it's a zombie movie, despite what the director says, it's a zombie movie, and a very controversial one at that. Everyone who watches zombie movies is familiar with George A. Romero, right, and his formula for how zombies should move and how they should act. 28 Days Later took that blueprint and threw it out the fucking window. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Before this movie, it was pretty much agreed upon that zombies were slow moving. Infectious human beings that took a long time to just move and make their way to people. And then with transformations into said creatures, it you got to see that transformation, right? It was usually from a bite, right? A zombie would bite you and then you would transform into a zombie. But that process would be slow. You would have time to kind of grieve in a sense, right? Like grieve the loss of the friend or the or the companion that you're with hunting these zombies with. But not in 28 Days Later. Most of the narrative of zombie films were also centered around the agony of protecting one another against the zombie outbreak or perhaps caring for a loved one after they've been attacked and bitten. Though with 28 Days Later, that's not the case. <laughs> this movie takes those intimate crisis moments that we're so used to in a zombie film and drop kicks them in the head. <laughs> Instead, the zombies are rage virus infected people who could transform quickly and attack living people viciously and quickly. There's no wait time here. There's no warning. They just hunt, they kill, and they're vicious. This movie gave us zombies which were actually dangerous and either had to be outrunned or outgunned. And many people didn't like that idea, <laughs> right? That's what made this a controversial horror movie and a zombie, controversial zombie movie was that many people didn't like the idea of fast-moving running zombies, especially considering the nostalgic aspect of George A. Romero's movies. Though this trope of the fast-moving zombies became much more solidified when Zack Snyder released his 2004 zombie film Dawn of the Dead, which was a reimagined version, of course, of George A. Romero's film. He also had zombies who were fast. They sprinted. They were aggressive. And they were definitely fast enough to catch anyone who ran from them. So despite the outcry for many people, and I think it was really just the change, right? People don't like change, yet they say they do. 
<laughs> and when it comes to our horror movies, we always say we want something unique. We always say we want something different. But when we get it, we bash it. and <laughs> We criticize it. And we say we want to go back to the old way. But this just proved that many people did like fast moving zombies. So much so that Dawn of the Dead actually is one of the greatest zombie movies of the 2000s generation. And a great zombie movie remake, despite the fact that it went against George A. Romero's formula of slow-paced zombies and moved towards the 28 Days Later formula of fast-moving, aggressive zombies. At the end of the day, it did nothing but help the zombie genre and completely revitalized it to things that we have now, like Walking Dead. It's one of the reasons we have The Walking Dead. World War Z. Like, there's so many different zombie movies that came after it that were inspired by the break of this horror movie trope. And another one that we're going to be talking about not only broke a horror movie trope, but it also stands as an underrated horror movie, in my opinion. And that movie is Sinister. Sinister, it has a different tone to it than most paranormal movies. And while it does try to venture off into different subgenres and may at times bite off more than it can chew, it's a great venture into true crime. And the paranormal that blends together with it is a terrifying experience. If you haven't checked out Sinister, and I know many people that I've talked to actually haven't, watch it. It is a great, underrated horror movie. It came out in 2012, and it was directed and co-written by Scott Derrickson along with Robert Cargill. And it stars Ethan Hawke, who's a great actor, right? Ethan Hawke is, is awesome. And he stars as a struggling true crime writer who discovers videos in his new home depicting grisly murders, which ends up putting his family in danger. Robert Cargill was inspired to write this story based on a nightmare he had after watching the 2002 film The Ring, which I don't understand. Who's having nightmares after watching The Ring? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, thought, I find The Ring to be one of the most stupidest horror movies ever created. We'll maybe touch on that in a podcast episode where I just literally tear The Ring apart because, man, I have ammunition to tear that fucking movie apart. The Ring is terrible. Ringu, the Japanese version, amazing absolutely stellar piece of filmmaking right there but the ring <laughs> garbage <laughs> absolute garbage i would throw that in the trash and not even light it on fire i would just let the trash compactor do its dirty deed along with all the poop that goes with it i hate the ring <laughs> but maybe we'll go over that in another episode if somebody uh if people want it bad enough now, the story of sinister it starts off with you know the familiar haunted house kind of story which is simple yet effective Though in this movie, the haunting of the house behaves more like a parasite that infects the host and moves along with it instead of just staying in the house and haunting the house itself. Because many of the horror movie tropes of haunted houses, it has us saying, get out of the house, <laughs> right? Your house is haunted. Move out of the house. <laughs> Why are you staying in the house when it is haunted? But see, with this movie, instead of the house itself being haunted, it's the host who then travels between houses so it can continue its cursed life cycle. And in most haunted house movies, like I'm saying, we're yelling at our screens, right? For the families to just move out of the house. That should solve all your problems, right? Well, in this case, it doesn't. The biggest mistake that's made in this movie is when the main character actually takes himself and his family out of the house to move back into their old house, which breaks that horror movie trope completely. The demon of the movie starts consuming children once they move to the new home, as that's what it incites its power. So the, the, the demon or villain, however you want to call it, in this movie, plays off of the horror movie trope, <laughs> right? It plays off of the horror movie trope of the family should move out of the house to get away from the haunt. Well, if they do, I'm just going to follow them. Breaks the trope completely. The haunting still happens, even though... You moved out of the house. That makes the story itself absolutely terrifying. And it takes the typical haunted house trope and turns it into the cause for the movie's plot. Absolute genius. It's an absolute genius way to take a horror movie trope that people are expecting to happen. Right? When you're going into a paranormal movie or a haunted house movie, you're going in waiting for those tropes and jump scares to happen. You know it will. But in this movie, th despite the fact that it still does, it goes, yeah. Yeah, you know, we'll give you that trope, but we're going to turn it on its head and make it the cause for the plot. Boom. Absolute genius. And that's what makes Sinister a completely underrated horror movie and a great horror movie. I love Sinister. And it wouldn't have been possible, well, along with really many other horror movies, wouldn't be possible without the ones that came before it, right? There's many horror movies that not only created the iconic horror movie tropes, but were also inspiration for many horror movies that came later on that actually inspired even more horror movie tropes 
we're going to go over one of those movies right now. This one really paved the way for many of the 70s and 80s slasher films that we've come to love. It heavily contributed to the template of what would become the slasher genre as a whole. We're talking about Black Christmas, the movie which gave us the blueprint of the final girl trope, the unseen killer, and the urban myth of the killer inside the house. Now, while this movie it didn't necessarily break horror movie tropes, as it was the blueprint for many, it provided audiences with a very unique experience compared to other horror movies that had come before it. Black Christmas actually was originally called Silent Night, Evil Night, FYI, which is funny considering Silent Night, Deadly Night, and it came out in 1974, directed by Bob Clark and written by A. Roy Moore. And the film surrounds a group of sorority sisters who begin receiving threatening phone calls and are eventually stalked by a deranged killer during Christmas who kills each of them off one by one. And the story was inspired by the urban legend of the babysitter and the man upstairs, along with a series of murders that actually took place in Montreal, Quebec. Despite receiving mixed reviews upon its release, Black Christmas actually became one of the most iconic horror movies of the genre. It's credited for many classic horror movies that we've come to love, such as John Carpenter's Halloween. And during many sequences of the film, the audience is forced to see the world through the killer's eyes as he makes his way through the sorority and the attic where he watched his future victims. And having this point of view from the killer, it doesn't necessarily make us identify with the killer beyond seeing the world through his eyes, but it does change how we experience the movie. Watching certain scenes from the killer's point of view, it creates feelings of anxiety and makes us want to know even more who the killer is, what are his motivations or her motivations behind what they're doing. Are they mentally ill? Do they have some sort of reason? Do they have some sort of connection with these sorority sisters? What is going on? Why are we getting this point of view from the killer? The thing is, Black Christmas doesn't give, it, give us that, right? It leaves us with that uncomfortable feeling every time we watch the movie of who is this killer? What is the motive behind this killer? Are they just mentally deranged and they're killing sorority girls? Like, what is the deal? But we never know. We never find out, which is one of the greatest things about Black Christmas, leaving that mystery, because that's what creates the horror. That's what creates the suspense is our own fucking imaginations, right? It's our imaginations that scare us and the things that we can think of that could be happening instead of being told this is what happening, because it could be much less than what we thought it was. And then we're like, oh, well, that's not really terrifying, but we'll go and think of the most terrifying thing imaginable, which is what will actually scare us. Horror movies before Black Christmas, they focused on making us feel uncomfortable with our spaces, specifically. Rosemary's Baby, for example, with spaces that we can't see. Texas Chainsaw Massacre had Leatherface suddenly appearing from anywhere. Though in Black Christmas, seeing through the point of view of the killer makes the presence of a threat that much more real. Because you're not seeing the killer. You are the killer. At that point, right? The, like you're looking through the point of view of the killer. You're not seeing the killer. You're not an external viewer that's watching a killer kill someone or watching a killer act upon something. You are seriously in the mind of the killer. You are in his point of view. You then feel like you're experiencing the movie as the killer, right? And it creates that suspense and anticipation as to what the killer is planning on doing next. And of course, Black Christmas paved the way for so many horror movies that came after it. There's many directors and filmmakers that credit Black Christmas for the reason why they even developed their own horror movie. And it created so many horror movie tropes that later would be broken, which is the next movie we're going to be, uh, to be talking about here. Because if we're going to be talking about horror movie tropes and movies that broke the mold... We have to talk about this movie. <laughs> this movie needs to be included in any conversation that involves horror movie tropes and breaking that mold. So in 1996, <laughs> and I bet that's all I have to say to horror movie fans right now, and you know exactly what movie I'm going to talk about. So in 1996, a slasher film was released by Wes Craven, and written by Kevin Williamson, called Scream. You may have heard of it. <laughs> it's a story that follows a high school student named Sydney Prescott and her group of friends who become targets of a mysterious killer in a Halloween costume. And did you guys know that the film was actually inspired by a true story? It was the real-life case of the Gainesville Ripper, which influenced the film Scream, along with other horror films like Halloween 1978, inspiring Scream. So this movie came out in 1996, and it gave the horror genre a shot of adrenaline that was much needed at the time. Nothing innovative was happening with the horror genre, let alone the slasher subgenre in the 90s. Like, we had movies like Silence of the Lambs and Candyman, and, you know, that was great and all. But once Scream was released, the entire horror community was turned on their heads. 
<laughs> like Wes Craven took Scream to the next level with a concept of openly by dissecting the various parts of the horror genre for the audience's entertainment while still using it as part of the narrative. Fucking genius. Scream is by far one of the most genius horror movies when it comes to taking the genre and not necessarily making fun of it because I don't feel like Scream made fun of the genre or it played too much of the horror movie tropes. It just said, hey, we know you're gonna be coming here to watch a slasher film. We know the slasher subgenre has been absolute kife since the 80s. So we're gonna take those tropes that you somewhat love to hate and we're gonna make you love them. <laughs> and we're gonna make you fall in love with this movie. And that's absolutely what they did. One of my favorite aspects of Scream was exactly how Wes Craven utilized horror movie tropes to his advantage by distracting the audience. Many of the horror movie tropes pointed us towards suspects who weren't the killer at all in an effort to distract us, which worked for the most part. Outside of the fact that the final girl has sex in the movie and survives, the biggest aspect of this movie that smashes horror movie tropes is the fact that horror movies exist in the universe, right? Like Sydney has sex and she becomes a final girl. That totally breaks that trope, right? Because I know everybody, as we were watching that first scream and, you know, Sydney at the beginning of the movie is like, I'm not going to have sex. I'm not going to have sex, da, da, da. So you in your head are like, oh, okay. So she's the goody two shoes girl. She's going to end up being the final girl. And then she has sex in the movie and loses her virginity. And you're like, wait, what the fuck? So she's not going to be the final girl. But then she turns out to be the final girl. Totally smashes that horror movie trope. And then you bring in the fact that horror movies exist in this universe. They actually use horror movie logic in the Scream movies. That was never done before. Never. There was never a movie that was released in the horror genre where horror movies actually existed in it. Not like Scream. Scream fucking took it and ran with it. For example, Randy. Randy, the character Randy, who's played by Jamie Kennedy, gives a speech on the rules of horror, which clearly outlines ways in which the movie is going to break tradition completely. Like, like as soon as he starts going, these are the rules of horror movies, you know that Scream is smashing every single horror movie that came before it. It's taking the tropes and going, yeah, we're going to do them, but we're going to create a whole new trope, which is horror movies exist in this universe, and we're going to play off those rules. Like, I love it. I absolutely love it, even to this day. Like, the only movie, in my opinion, that's smarter than Scream is Saw. But Scream is right behind Saw when it comes to just using ingenuity to develop a horror movie. Things like you can't have sex or drink, yet Sydney does. Broken. Also mentioning how saying, I'll be right back is a sure way to get yourself killed and a one-way ticket to meet the movie's killer. <gasps> Stu did that in the movie. Even though he ended up being the killer, he still did that and broke that trope. Though one of the biggest things that Scream did to set itself apart was introducing more than one killer in the movie. Slasher movies from the 80s and the early 90s always represented a single killer that audiences could fixate on and remember, right? Jason Voorhees, Candyman, Michael Myers, right? These are all single killers in the horror movie. Not, not more, there's not more than one killer. Because you don't want your audience to be dividing their attention between multiple killers. But the thing is, the way they did it in Scream, you don't know that there's multiple killers. Because they're all wearing the same costume. It doesn't matter how many killers there are in a Scream movie because they're all wearing the Ghostface costume. So at the end of the day, you're still only identifying with Ghostface. You're not identifying with the actual killer. Because you don't even know who the killer is until the last 10-15 minutes of the movie. Which at that point, you're done identifying with them. You're still identifying with Ghostface. It's an absolute genius way to bring in a second killer while still giving the audiences something to fixate on. One single character, an icon, to fixate on. And because of this, Ghostface was born. And no matter how many physical killers there are at the end of the day, it's always Ghostface in the end. And this is where that memorable figure comes into play. And because of the mask and costume, this opens the door for the franchise to have new killers each movie. They don't have to bring back a killer. I know we all want Stu back. But without Sydney, it's absolutely worthless. So let's not, let's not hope that Stu's coming back now. But the fact that you can bring new killers in for every movie brings a plethora of new mysteries available that can be born from this concept. So Scream's paved the way for more entries in the franchise to come. It's obvious. It's a given. And it's not the only movie that completely smashed the horror genre and went, hey, I'm going to give you a horror movie that completely messes with your head and messes with the genre on so many levels. It wasn't the only one. It wasn't the only one. We've got one more movie that we are going to go over. And this one, this one completely broke the mold, guys. Like, Scream, Scream is great in its own right. But this next movie is a masterclass in fucking horror. And completely turned the horror genre on its head. Like, 
I cannot express to you how much this movie impacted me on a personal level. Like not even just as a horror fan, but on a personal level, this movie hit me really hard. And that movie is Jordan Peele's Get Out. Like it was his directorial debut and no doubt has become one of the most iconic and most anticipated directors in the horror genre. Like who's, who's not waiting for Nope? Everybody is waiting on the edge of their seat for Nope right now. I know this. Like, yeah, I spoke about how, you know, Halloween ends is my most anticipated, blah, blah, blah. But I'm still here chomping at the bit for Nope. Like Nope is, I, you know, we don't even know what it is. <laughs> Like, from the trailers, we don't even know what this movie is. Is it a sci-fi movie? Is it a horror movie? Is it a Western movie? We have no idea what Nope is. And Jordan Peele wants that. That is part of his genius, is releasing a trailer that gives us very little on what the movie's about. Right? He did the same with Get Out. He did the same with Us. Nope is going to be amazing, guys. <laughs> Like, I know it is. And it's not going to be anything like we expect. It's going to be a different vibe from his other movies. But the thing about Jordan Peele is that he is a motherfucking genius. That dude is a genius. And we know it from watching Get Out, right? This movie was released in 2017. And it's about a young man who uncovers the shocking secrets of his wife's family when he meets them for the first time. A very racially charged film. Like, if you haven't seen this movie, you need to. I'm telling you right now. This is, a mo this is one of those movies that everybody has to watch kind of thing. Like, if you're into horror and if you're into just racially charged stories, this is a movie you have to see. You need to see this. I'm telling you right now. It's obviously critically acclaimed. And it's a massive commercial success. The movie itself grossed $255 million dollars worldwide on a budget of only 4.5 million dollars and it was also the 10th most profitable film of 2017 out of every movie that was released not just horror movies and it even went on to be nominated for best picture at the oscars and i think there's only like six horror movies in the history of the oscars that has been nominated for an academy award i'm pretty sure the other ones were like the exorcist silence of the lambs uh, and there were some others i can't remember off the top of my head but it was it's in a uh an elite category of horror movies to be nominated for Best Picture. And it still continues to maintain a strong reputation. Many actually cite it to be one of the best films of the 21st century. And it's definitely the best of the 2010s. Hands down. There's not a horror movie that can come close to get out in the 2010s. And if there is, I challenge you to show me it. It's a movie whose entire premise hinges on subverting the black characters die first trope. Not only did the hero of the film survive and escape, the Armitage family's victims also suffer a version of immortality. Chris's friend Rod, who plays the extremely genre-savvy character, who's the equivalent of a police officer and goes as far to explain his TSA training makes him a keen investigator, Rod is their own version of the useless police officer who ultimately becomes a hero. So they smash tropes. Not only did they create a racially charged film that really took audiences by surprise, but they smashed all the horror movie tropes before it and gave us a hero that was very much unexpected. Kind of like what George A. Romero did with Night of the Living Dead in casting a black character as the lead during a time where racism was very prevalent in society. And George A. Romero said, no, I'm casting a, a black lead. We're going to do this. And it became one of the most iconic horror movies of all time based off of that. So I still say that Get Out is one of the greatest movies. I absolutely adore it. I love it. And there's no doubt that it's catapulted Jordan Peele to stardom in the horror genre. There's, there's just no doubt. So now we're going to head over and get some thoughts and opinions from my lovely audience and fans and listeners who tune into the Cabin of Horrors podcast every week. I polled a lot of people on my Instagram and my Discord server. What are some of your favorite horror movie tropes and stereotypes? And if you want to share why, I'd love to hear it. So the first one we have is actually from my brother from another mother, Scareborn, who dropped into our Discord, victims fleeing and tripping over invisible things, fumbling with keys, engine and cars always failing, and unarmed Americans. <laughs> and before this, I didn't even realize that that was a trope. Like, I'm Canadian, for those who don't know, I'm, I am a Canadian, and to see unarmed Americans as a horror movie trope, I didn't even realize <laughs> <laughs> that that was a horror movie trope. But I guess in America, that would be considered a uh, a horror movie trope. So those are some of Scareborn's favorites. And he also says bad guys are either silent or mocking their victims. And the final girl trope. That's some of his favorite tropes. 
The next one we got is from Shane Gone Wild, another one of my absolute homies from Discord, saying hearing a weird noise and instead of locking doors, goes to investigate. God, that's a trope, eh? <laughs> And we're all just saying, why are you going towards the creepy noise? Why are you going towards the creepy noise? Every single time. Another one he mentions is the car breaking down. Let's wander into the woods that they've never been in with, of course, no cell service. That's the typical trope. That's that's not only a trope, that's a plot. <laughs> that is the plot. Another one Shane mentions is, oh, hey, we're lost. Instead of working and staying together, let's all split up. <laughs> or a weapon or an object that would save a victim always an inch too far away. <laughs> right? Those are the tropes that we've come to know and love when it comes to horror movies. Another one that we've got here is from my buddy Led Devil, dropped it in our Discord, saying evil clowns splitting up when you should stay in a group, the bad guy not really being dead when you just shot him with multiple rounds and possibly a rocket launcher. Oh man, we're talking about Jason Voorhees here, aren't we? <laughs> Jason Voorhees has died so many ways, so many times and just keeps coming back. So yes, definitely a horror movie trope right there. <laughs> I appreciate everyone who gave their thoughts and their opinions on horror movie tropes. I absolutely love hearing from all of you guys. You're all absolutely amazing. And if you want to talk about more horror movies, come hop into our Discord, follow me on Instagram, instagram.com slash cabin of horrors podcast, and come hang out on Twitch, twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors. We're going to be streaming every single weekend. Sometimes we stream during the week, depending on how life pans out. But I'd love for you to come into our Twitch, say hi, hang out with us, get scared because trust me, I do get scared and you can actually do jump scares with me on stream. When you come to my Twitch channel and you stay and you watch and you engage, you actually earn points that you can spend on doing different things in that channel, whether it be a jump scare to see me get scared or whether it be to feed our pet xenomorph Bob that you can see on our streams. There's so many different things you can do with your points and all you have to do to get those points is follow or hang out. Just hang out in our chat, say hi, watch the stream and you get points the entire time you're doing it. So I'd love to see you on Twitch. Come hang out twitch.tv slash cabin of horrors i'd love for all of you to come hang out and this will wrap up our episode of the podcast thanks again for listening to this week's episode i appreciate all of you who support and listen to the podcast every week next week we're going to be having saw three so if you haven't yet head over to the instagram head over to the discord and drop your thoughts on the franchise i will talk to you guys all next week and in the meantime stay scared <laughs>